Oh, 800 80 is our number, 9292 is the text. I'm going to play for you now uh, an interview that I did two nights ago. Um, Dr. David Roby was actually on board for the final 10 weeks of the Rainbow Warrior. He was uh, covering another story, and he'll explain that in the interview, uh, and then was uh, very much involved, right, and was going to travel with them up to Mururoa as well. Uh, he lives in Auckland, so at the time when the ship docked here, get in preparation for that, he was actually living at, living at home, staying at home. Um, but he's in Indonesia at the moment, so we couldn't have him live. So uh, a couple of nights ago... Um, I managed to uh, track him down and speak. He is the director now of the Pacific Media Centre at AUT University, and he'll just explain. Hi, David. Thanks a lot for joining us all the way from Indonesia. Oh, thanks, Sam. <laughs> Have you been given a, giving a paper over there? You've been doing some Yes, of yes, a, a paper actually about uh, independent uh, media and a project that we have at uh, the University of South Pacific, a project called Pacific uh, Media Watch and uh, uh, how that um, gives independent um, uh, news and analysis uh, around the Asia-Pacific region. Now, look, one of the, one of the, our uh, main reasons for getting in touch with you has, of course, been uh, over, the, um, over the Greenpeace and the Rainbow Warrior events of all those years ago. Now, I, I trust you're not sick of talking about this. You must be everybody's go-to person. Uh, but I wanted to ask you just about your involvement and if you can sort of um, give us a, a sort of a, a summary of your involvement with the Rainbow Warrior, but also just the events themselves. Right. Well, back back then, uh, I was a uh, freelance journalist uh, specialising in uh, South Pacific affairs and and particularly environmental issues. And when the voyage of the Rainbow Warrior is being planned to go to the Marshall Islands uh, to protest over nuclear testing there, but also to uh, relocate uh, the Rongelap Islanders that had been um, uh, had a you know le- the legacy of nuclear testing, the American uh, nuclear tests that had been uh, harmed the Rongelap Islanders, and the idea was that the Rainbow Warrior was going to take these people to a new location on Majato Atoll. And uh, Elaine Shaw, the late Elaine Shaw, who was then um, a key person in, um, in Greenpeace and so on, was very concerned that a number of journalists were going on the, the voyage, but they were all from the Northern Hemisphere. And there was no one actually sort of representing any kind of New Zealand media. And she thought this was a very important um, story to be told. And so she approached me as a freelance journalist and said, well, would you be interested uh, in going and reporting on that? And I was, but you know, as a freelancer, it's actually quite a, a commitment of time because it was about an 11-week voyage that I was, um, you know, had to plan for. But I, I decided, well, this was going to be a very important story. I had no idea, of course, you know, the eventual bombing. But um, I thought the humanitarian aspect of it was just such a major story that I lined up a few media outlets and uh, reported on board the ship for, right through the uh, the voyage. And then, of course, it led to a book later on, Eyes of Fire. Right. Now, that was about that last voyage and also about the bombing as well. Did you sort of cover that? that Yes, yes. But I, you see, um, what I tried to do, because my plans had been all along, was to write a book, but about the humanitarian aspects. And, of course, all the spy drama and the bombing and and so on, there were other books that came out um, at the time. But none none of the books, none of the other books are written by anybody who's actually on board Rainbow Warrior. So I was really, I really tried hard to balance the spy drama with uh, the humanitarian side of the story as well. But the book, uh, Eyes of Fire, did include uh, both. One of the things this week that's been interesting to me and uh, has been, I was only uh, 12 years old at the time, and those, those names are sort of familiar to me. I can remember Elaine Mafar and Dominique Prieur were just mentioned so many times, probably the only two, two French names I could have pronounced as a youngster. But, but this week, looking at the events of that time, it, it just seems beyond belief that it took place at all. Is, is that still the feeling feeling you have? Um, and, and was well, that the yeah, I, think, I think so. As a journalist on board, you know, it's disbelief at the time and still disbelief over this period. And I, I guess that that would be, um, uh, you know, a common view for, for many of the crew members, um, uh, you know, at that, that time as well. Uh, but particularly with um, Mafar and Pure, you know, they, um, I guess it was some luck of the New Zealand police actually arresting at least two out of it because there were 13 French agents actually operating as part of this, um, you know, bombing um, sort of mission. Um, Operation uh, Satanique, uh, as it was called, 
Um, and uh, you know, I guess I guess the police in those days were fairly naive about um, global terrorists. I mean, I mean, talk about the war on terror today. This was a real live example of um, uh, you know of state terrorism against a uh, peaceful nation and and against the uh, environmental organisation that was no threat to anybody really. Um, and um, you know, when you think of what happened to Mafar and Pura, at least they were they were arrested by the in the investigation and they were sentenced to ten years imprisonment uh, for manslaughter in the end. It probably should have been murder. Um, this was a planned, uh, you know, uh, attack after all. But um, but they were they were sentenced um, for ten years for for manslaughter. And then there was the deal done between um, the New Zealand government, David Long, his government at the time, and the French, where. Uh, these two were carted off to serve out their so-called sentence um, in how Atoll in French Polynesia, and only for three years, not for the ten years, three years, and how Atoll was in fact really the military club med for for you know for the uh, military operations in the Pacific. So it was hardly any kind of um, penalty, and then both of them went back to France as heroes. Yeah, and one gets the sense that. Um, you, that New Zealand's hands were tied a little bit. You know, again, reading it, and, and this is stuff that would have gone over my head as a youngster, but that there, there were, um, you know, tr trade embargoes were threatened to New Zealand if they if they didn't sort of follow. Do you, do you feel that the New Zealand government did enough at the time, or do you, do you feel the well, hands I th well, I think it's outrageous. Like, the whole um, scheme, the whole attack was outrageous in the first, first instance. You know, it's just inconceivable that an attack like that could have been, you know, launched against a major nation in the world, a peaceful nation. But it, but it's bad enough that they did that. But then the uh, French uh, government at the time then also blackmailed New Zealand um, over trade, etc. This is why both Mumfar and Pru uh, ended up, um, and you know, with just a nice pleasure pleasure sentence uh, over in um, the, in the military club met at Howe. Um, it, it, that was outrageous as well. I came across a report, I think it was uh, an interview that done with um, Geoffrey Palmer, the um, Deputy Prime Minister at the time, at the 20-year at the anniversary of this happening. So, um, uh, And he was saying then that, you know, politically things were pretty tense for about a decade with the French. For Absolutely. Um, but there's also another aspect to it. And so this was an extraordinarily tense time for New Zealand. But um, often we saw the events just as an isolated attack um, on this a peaceful environmental um, ship, the environmental camp, um, you know, sort of organisation, Greenpeace, but also on peaceful New Zealand. But you have to put in the context of that period. Um, I was, as a journalist, I was reporting on um, the French, um, you know, colonial policies or neo-colonial policies in the region, and, um, and happening at the same time, you had a um, insurrection by uh, um, indigenous Karnaks in New Caledonia demanding for independence, and then you also had. Um, uh, um, you know, strong groups in French Polynesia also demanding independence, and um, people like Oscar Tiamaru, who later became uh, president several times of uh, French Polynesia, was he was the he was the mayor of Far, uh, which is the largest community in the capital Papeete of um, French Polynesia. And he was he was pro, he was he was basically pro independence, but also uh, against nuclear testing. You know. Um, so he had this, and then he had a, a assassinations um, in New Caledonia. One of the big leaders, uh, Eloy Mashoro, was assassinated um, in 1986. And then you also had the Uvia Cave Massacre, where 19 indigenous Karnaks were were um, uh, basically slaughtered in a, in a you know, terrible massacre. And that was all in the expediency of the elections at the time between Mitterrand and the um, president's, uh, or President Mitterrand at the time, and, and Prime Minister Jacques Chirac, who was uh, contesting the uh, presidency. So all these things were going on. So you had this, these mad, paranoid um, sort of uh, characters, uh, I think, within the French uh, Secret Service and also within the high, high levels of um, the po you know, political machinery in, in France. And, and this is sort of a uh, paranoid mentality allowed these things to happen, particularly the attack on the Rainbow Warrior. Coming uh, sort of away from the, the sort of the political end for a moment, just down to, say, the, the end of the general public, obviously things were very tense politically. W what did it do for, like, the, the average man and woman on the street's perception of, of France and of French people? Well, I think it did enormous uh, harm for a very long time. Um, personally, um, I've 
uh, you know, sort of been quite an admirer of France and for quite a number of levels. And I lived there uh, for for a number of years um, as a journalist and worked there. But um, I felt that what happened there was um, so, so, you know, horrendously damaged um, relations between um, France and New Zealand. And that lingered on for a very long time. There was a very strong feeling, I think, in New Zealand of, of distrust, uh, anything to do with uh, France. And I think, it, um, and unfortunately, that was the case. And um, even though it was political, you know, mad political decisions, um, unfortunately, that, that carries across to how people perceive another nation. And, um, and France was seen very negatively um, by, by New Zealand. And I think average French people didn't really understand uh, why New Zealand felt like we did. Now, look, that, uh, the, 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 the day of the, uh, the bombing itself, were you in and around the, the boat then? Were you in and around the ship? I was, I was in the, uh, I was, um, I had a cabin, um, in the ship, um, next to Fernando Pereira, the, um, photo- uh, photographer and photojournalist who, who died uh, on the Rambo Warrior. But, uh, of course, living in Auckland, uh, when we arrived back on the July the 7th, um, well, I went back home, um, to, you know, back to my home. Right. Um, and so, uh, I only just got, um, phoned late, late that night after the, the bombing, um, to my shock. And, of course, I went down to the Rambo Warrior uh, fairly quickly. At, at that, that time, but I wasn't actually on board at the time. Mm-hmm. But the interesting thing for me was, um, well, uh, when the Rainbow Warrior was, um, you know, sort of hauled up off the seabed and uh, taken over to Devonport Naval Base and refitted, you know, eventually, and sort of, um, I found that um, I had forgotten to take my passport when um, when I left uh, the Rainbow Warrior. It was still in the captain's, you know, sort of uh, locker up in the, um, uh, you know, the bridge, and. Uh, so this was recovered later, and so this is the only memento that I have today from the actual bombing. So my passport was you know, bombed and sank to the um, bottom of, um, you know, of, of Auckland Harbour. Must have been a very uh, sad time for, for you all involved with uh, with Fernando Pereira passing away. Um, you know, being well, passing away, being murdered. You know, uh, Fernando, he, he actually went back on board after the first bombing uh, took place to uh, rescue his cameras and so on. And then the second bomb went off, and there's a very narrow sort of gang uh, passageway down to the cabins and the aft area of the Rambo Warrior. And he got swept back uh, with the, the current of the water shooting down um, and got trapped and, uh, and drowned. Uh, and, you know, but much is made of that. Well, that somehow that that was some kind of accidental death. It wasn't, you know, that was, as to my mind, that's murder. Um, there was no warning. Uh, the first bomb went off, and it's just probably incredibly lucky that the others um, didn't lose their lives that night. Um, I mean, it's just a shocking, um, uh, murderous um, sort of uh, attack um, um, on, you know, on, a, on a peaceful, friendly country. Professor David Roby, thanks so much for taking the time to, uh, to talk to us all the way from Indonesia. Thanks so much, Sam.